it's a huge pleasure to be here and have the chance to address you as you leave LBS to go and to be the future leaders of this world. Now, when I address you at orientation and also in my final lecture, those were based on talks that I'd given before. So I update the material every year, but the core heart was unchanged. But the world today is very different from the world that you left when you stepped into LBS two years ago. So I didn't want to just update an old talk. I wanted to prepare something completely new and completely fresh, which was specific to the challenges of 2017 and specific to the class of 2017. So I decided to crowdsource what I should talk about. So I posted the following question. I will soon be addressing LBS's graduating MBA class. The last graduation speech I gave was in 2014, and the world is sadly a different place now. What one message do you think is important to convey to the world's future leaders today? And I got 26 very detailed responses. And obviously, it's difficult to summarize 26 different views into one talk. So I tried to think about what is the one word that can capture all of these themes? And obviously, while no one word can do justice to all 26, there was one word that I thought did this better than any others. And that one word was explore. So you see, almost by complete accident, we've come full circle. Because when I addressed you at orientation, the talk then was called MBA, the opportunity to explore. But the opportunities to explore are not just in the MBA. And the mindset of exploration is not just for the MBA. Both of these are for the rest of your careers and lives, just like the MBA is hopefully preparation for the rest of your careers and lives. So the talk that I have today at Capstone, I'm going to call The Exploring Life, and it's going to be based on, on three interconnected areas. So the first is the idea of exploring other viewpoints. So two months ago at LBS TEDx, I talked about confirmation bias, the idea that we have our own viewpoint and we accept data that supports it and we reject data that contradicts it. But today I want to move beyond that talk and focus on something I really didn't have much time to talk about back then. And that's not the use of hard, rigorous data, but how we explore other people's subjective opinions. So even if somebody else's opinion is something that we think is completely illogical, even if we think it is something which is contradicted by the evidence, it's still an opinion that somebody else has. And that other person is still a human being, and as we saw last year, that person still has voice, it's st that person still has a right to vote. So find out why those people think the way they do. Right, because the leading academic theories could all say free trade is a great thing, but those theories are purely academic if millions of people think differently. And that applies not only to some fact-based fact issues, but also to some, some moral issues which are even thornier. So like it or not, millions of people around the world will think differently for you and I for, on, on thorny issues such as abortion or gay marriage. So recently a friend posted on social media, I refuse to be tolerant of ideas that are just flat out wrong. But for a moral-based issue, Right, even if we're flagrantly offended by another viewpoint, that other viewpoint is, is not wrong, it's just a different opinion, and we'd like to try to find out why is that opinion different. So what does this practically mean? So what it means is to talk to people very different from ourselves. Now, that seems obvious, even patronizing, but why I mention this is this is something that I know that I myself was very guilty of for many years. So when I first started as a faculty member, I really didn't talk to many people outside my institution. Yes, I interacted with other people. I right? played in local sports teams, and I, I knew what jobs other people did. Right? That's the first question you ask after finding out somebody's name. But I didn't really know those people. I didn't know what got them up in the morning, what made them tick. I didn't know what their hopes and dreams were. I didn't know what their fears and frustrations were, because it's in those fears and frustrations and hopes and dreams that lead to people having different opinions and perhaps voting differently or thinking in a different way. And so we can think about the fact that in the next couple of days, well, tomorrow, you're going to walk out into the world with an MBA from one of the best business schools in the world. And 
this we can think about not that just that, but the fact we're joining this alumni network, which is a brilliant network, and that network is going to be even more brilliant with you in the network. And we can think about our education and our network as being like white trousers. So if you wear white trousers, you want to protect them, you see the other world, the outside world as dirty, and you don't want to interact with them. But our education, our network, they're not just something which absolves us from the responsibility to speak to outsiders, but they shoulder us with the responsibility to speak up for outsiders. And the only way that we can do that is by finding out what they think. And it's obviously one thing to talk to somebody when they come to you and share their opinion, but it's another thing to actively seek other viewpoints. So what we explored in class, we explored the story of Simon Marks of Marks and Spencer, that chairman who walked around the shop floor to see firsthand how customers and workers are being treated. Some of you came to the lecture by Will Shu, the CEO of Deliveroo, who when he started, he spent uh, five hours a day for the first nine months delivering the food himself so that he could see what it was like to be a rider. Even now, as the CEO of a billion-dollar company, he tries to do at least one shift a week. So the following quote is something which I took from Guardian, and it's, it's something which really hit home with me and, and touched a nerve. Now, it's not something which is the typical pump-up quote that you will see in a graduation speech, but I've decided to share it even though it might hit a nerve, because I think it's so important in 2017 to step into other people's shoes and find out what they think. And here it is. If you would stereotype a group of people by presuming to guess their politics or deeming them inferior to yourself, say the ones who work third shift on a Boeing floor while others flew to Mexico during spring break, the ones who mopped McDonald's bathroom while others argued about the minimum wage on Twitter, the ones who cleaned out their lockers at a defunct pub's factory, while others drank craft beer at trendy bars. The ones who came back from the Middle East in caskets, while others wrote op-eds about foreign policy. Then consider that you might have more in common with Trump than you would like to admit. Now, at the moment in the UK, there's a big debate as to whether we should put workers on the boardroom. But far more important than bringing workers into the boardroom is bringing the boardroom into the workforce for a company's leaders to step out in the front line and see firsthand what it is like, rather than just hearing secondhand from a company rep. So I'm going to end this first point by saying be that leader, like Simon Marks, like Will Shoe, who is not just confined to the C-suite, but steps out, talks to, and more importantly listens to customers and workers, just as naturally as you talk or listen to another CEO within the LBS alumni network. And that leads to a more uplifting quote by um, Rudyard Kipling. If you can walk with crowd, talk with crowds and keep your virtue, or walk with kings, nor lose the common touch. The second point is to explore yourself. And this is something I could give an entire talk on, and, but already in orientation I talked about the idea of pushing yourself outside your comfort zone and taking risks. So I'm going to go through something different today. And the first is the idea of exploring failure. So in life you don't get what you think you deserve. You might be passed over for a promotion or an award, or even something smaller like an invitation to a wedding or a leadership role in a charity. And if you're like me, you get angry. And you get angry not only with the person making the decision, but you get angry with the entire system. How could the system lead to such an unfair decision? And then you think, well, do I really want to be part of this friend group? Or do you want to be part of this organization or even this career that makes decisions like this? But one thing that all great leaders cultivate, and one thing that I have not come close to cultivating, is the ability to live unoffended to live unoffended. So as Viktor Frankl wrote, between stimulus and response, there is that space, and in that space, there is the power to choose our response. We could choose not to be offended by a particular failure. First, the failure could be nothing to do with you. Right? It could well be that the company was just looking for a different type of employee, 
or there was a cap on the number of invitations, or it could be that the failure has everything to do with you, but then that's where the opportunity to explore comes. Right, you often get feedback as to why a decision was made, and my immediate reaction is to think that the entire feedback is bogus, but no feedback is ever 100% wrong. Even if only 1% is right, we can look at that 1% and see what we can learn from that. The second idea of exploring yourself is to explore disappointment. Now, this is linked to the first, right? Because often the outcome of failure is disappointment. You don't get the promotion, so you're in a disappointing job where you don't think you have much influence. But it also applies to things which are completely outside your control, nothing to do with failure. Maybe you're just stuck on a project with, with a colleague who you don't think is, is, is very competent. Right? And again, we can just complain about this situation, but no colleague is 100% incompetent. Right? You can always try and call out the gold, see the 1%, the 10%, even the 50% that you can learn from that person. Not only is that uplifting to that person and the entire team, but that's something that you can learn from yourself. And also, no job is 100% disappointing or disempowering. Well, you might all think, well, if I got promoted, I could do so much more for the company. But you can do a lot for the company, even in your current role. Politicians recently, they said, well, if I win the election, I can do so much good for the country. You can do lots of good for the country now. Right? As leader of the opposition, or even a local MP, right, you have massive influence. And even jobs that seem disappointing, they are great preparation for the rest of your career, for your 100-year life. Right, so Dave and Goliath, this is seen as a massive underdog story. But it wasn't an underdog story. Why? Because David had prepared to slay Goliath. Where had he prepared? Well, before he killed Goliath, his job was a shepherd. That's one of the most disappointing jobs. It was lonely, it was boring, and it was hidden. But while David was looking after a sheep, he learned to kill a lion and a bear. And that's how he learned to kill Goliath. David became a great leader in the lonely place, in the boring place, in the hidden place. Do not despise the day of small things. Disappointment, the lonely place, the hidden place, the boring place, can be a great opportunity to learn to be a great leader of the future. And that brings me to my final point, which is to explore creatively. So think about exploration as finding out what's already there. But it's not just about that. It's about creating what you'd like to be there. So when you have a kid trying to explore with some Lego bricks, by exploring, they build something and they create. And that's the same with a scientist using some molecules or maybe a leader looking at different management techniques. And this is something which is called creative exploration. So failure doesn't need to lead, need to, lead to taking offense. We can choose to create an unoffended future. Disappointment doesn't need to lead to despair. We could choose to create an opportunity to learn and develop. Now, the world today in 2017 is a scary place, right? It's a place with xenophobia, narrow-mindedness, questionable, unethical management practices. But it doesn't have to be this way. We can choose to create the future that we would like to step into. So people talk all the time about finding a fulfilling job, as if it's something that you find under a rock that if I turn over enough rocks, move from job to job to job, I'm going to find the perfect job, which is the same instant gratification that, that we see in today's world. But you don't just find a fulfilling job under a rock. You take a job that could be fulfilling, and you work very hard to make it fulfilling. You may end up in organizations where you don't respect the leaders that you have. But it's your responsibility to be the leader that you wish that you would have, and by doing so, that influences the people around you and changes culture. Now, in your economics class, you may have learned about multiple equilibria. And this is the idea that, let's say, let's take a bank run. If everybody else withdraws their money from the bank, then it's optimal for everybody else to withdraw as well, because the bank is going to go bankrupt. 
So how do we solve this? We need one person with a lot of deposits to choose to keep their money in the bank. And if that's the case, the bank is going to be solvent, and then it's optimal for everybody else to keep their money in as well. And what's the equivalent of somebody with lots of deposits? It's somebody with a lot of influence. And that somebody is you. Because you are LBS graduates, because of this education, the experience that we had, not just with the faculty, but with the program office, with your classmates, over these past two years, inside the classroom, outside the classroom, outside the UK even, you're going to be uniquely positioned to be great influences in whatever organization you end up in. Yes, it could be that you end up in a massive investment bank and you're an associate. You're not leading the whole organization immediately. But because of your skills, your talents, and in particular the attitude with which you apply yourselves, you may end up being a leader in your associate class. And by doing that, you will already have great influence. So we have this idea of always thinking about exploring. Then we can be the change that we would like to see, be the leader that you would like to have, and to change the equilibrium. Congratulations and all the very best. <laughs>